Welcome to the Massachusetts School of Law Educational Forum. Thank you for joining us. This program is brought to you by the Massachusetts School of Law and is shown nationwide. The topic for today's show is animal rights. Science is coming to understand that some animals express a broad range of emotions previously thought to be limited to human beings. They can reason, they can plan for the future, they can make and use tools, learn up to 300 signs in American Sign Language, as well as feel grief, rage, fear, joy, and even possess a sense of humor. How then do we draw a clear moral boundary between them and us? Is it still acceptable, morally, ethically, and legally, to inflict harm and suffering on animals because it benefits human civilization? A national nonprofit animal rights organization in defense of animals has launched a campaign called They Are Not Our Property, We Are Not Their Owners. Accordingly, the Boulder City Council, in a bold and progressive move, accepted a proposal to change the city's municipal code to refer to people as guardians of their companion animals instead of owners. Other municipalities, such as West Hollywood, as well as Berkeley, and the state of Rhode Island, have followed Boulder's lead. Supporters say that using Guardian will help raise awareness that humans have more responsibility towards living things in their keeping. Detractors argue it's just politically correct posturing. According to veterinarian Elliot Katz, founder of In Defense of Animals, as past liberation movements have repeatedly proven, the way we speak is a precursor to the way we act. Never forget that at one time women, children and slaves were considered property, were used, abused, discarded, or sometimes even killed. So joining me today is Dr. Elliot Katz, the president and the founder of In Defense of Animals, located in Mill Valley, California. They are the national animal protection organization dedicated to ending the abuse and the exploitation of the animals by protecting their rights, their welfare, and their habitats. For the last decades, Dr. Katz has been devoted to animal sanctuaries and animal rights movements worldwide, as well as reducing the overcrowding of animals in shelters and cruelty to animals in laboratories. He is a graduate of Cornell University College of Veterinary Medicine and is the father of two lovely daughters. Dr. Katz, welcome. <clears throat> Thank you. Also joining us today is Dr. Theodora Capaldo, a licensed psychologist and a health service provider with more than 25 years experience. Dr. Capaldo is currently president and executive director of the New England Anti-Vivisection Society and its educational affiliate, the Ethical Science and Education Coalition. She has served on the board of several national advocacy organizations, including Psychologists for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, and she has served on the Massachusetts Department of Public Health's committee to establish rules and regulations for the care of animals in labs. She is an educator, she is a popular, and she is a very well-respected lecturer. Dr. Capaldo, welcome to the show. <laughs> Thank you. Lastly, I wish to mention that Adrian Morrison was also scheduled to be a panelist, <clears throat> representing the voice of animal researchers. He is a veterinarian, a professor, and a researcher. He has also served as the director of the Program for Animal Research Issues at the Alcohol, Drug Abuse, and Mental Health Administration and the National Institute of Mental Health. At the last moment, he withdrew from participating. Accordingly, those who support animal research and their views will not be represented today. And I am Diane Sullivan, your host for today's show. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. Theo, let me start with you. Are humans justified in their domination <coughs> of animals or other species on this planet? Diane, I, I, think, I think that's a good question and an important place to start because what we need to look at is whether we're justified or not, it is how we've been doing business. So for a minute, if we look at whether it's worked or not, then we can really see whether we're justified in doing it despite our philosophical differences, and it's not working. Let me ask you, I guess, my real question, are animals lesser beings? Uh, no, animals are different beings, but if we continue mm -hmm. to see it as a hierarchy, we're going to continue to decimate species, uh, abuse animals for our own pleasure, and the, the entire system is collapsing, and that's why we're here today, to take a look at how we can change that 
so that we can have a system of balance and coexistence rather than domination. I think also part of the reason we're here today is hasn't science in recent years proven that certain animals, I'm thinking of chimpanzees in particular, have shown, science has really shown that animals are capable of much greater social uh, feelings and development than we previously thought, as well as far greater levels of cognition. And if that is true, doesn't that then impact how we treat animals? Science has done that, but science has really done what they always do, which is prove something we perhaps already knew. And I would ask your, your viewers to say if they've lived with a companion animal, whether that be a parakeet or, or a dog, or I think all of us who have empathic intelligence have understood that animals have emotions. I think um, there have been some who felt they needed to prove that, and I think that's important information for the disbelievers. But anybody who's interacted with a horse knows that there's an intelligent, emotional being who's different than me, but not less worthy. I, Dr. I, I, I was going to say, I think science, for the most part, has kind of gone out of its way to, to, to keep animals as, as non-thinking, non-feeling beings so that they can <coughs> uh, justify and do what uh, takes place in laboratories and other really abusive situations. Uh, Jane Goodall, when she first started her work, was ridiculed because she treated the and looked at the uh, chimpanzees as individuals and gave them names. And, uh, uh, you know, thanks to people like her who fought the scientific system. Uh, but even today, there, there are scientists who go on record saying animals don't really feel pain. They don't really, and these are automatic symptoms. The, the whole the whole beginning of, of vivisection, of experimenting and, and literally torturing animals in laboratories came about years, dec hundreds of years ago because of the fact that they believed, scientists in those days believed that uh, a other species were like, acted like clocks and, and uh, that when you heard an animal and it screamed, that was just simply a reflex. They didn't really feel a pain and still the scientific community, many of them still hang on to that kind of a feeling. Do they really believe that or <coughs> do they pretend to believe it because it made it easier? Uh, probably a little of both. Yeah. Some really believe it, some uh, rationalize it so that they can live with the, the abusive things they do. Uh, some who, and I think like Adrian Morrison, who will come up with any kind of rhetoric to rationalize the kinds of abusive things they do to animals. Let me ask you, as a veterinarian, when people brought in their cat or dog, their companion animal, <coughs> Did they understand that their animal was capable of feeling, do you believe? Did most people? <coughs> or were I, they thought of as proper? Uh, when I was practicing as a veterinarian, mm -hmm. uh, again, some people felt, you know, some were more sensitive and others not. Many, uh, many uh, people just <coughs> got the, the dog as a, as a watchdog or they got it for their children. Uh, and so they just <coughs> thought of, and the whole concept of animals as being property, as things, as its, it objectifies the animals and you don't tend to think of the needs and interests of the animals, only one's own interests and the value that that animal is giving to you. And if a, the, the companion animal X gets, becomes a nuisance or it's a bother, you, uh, it's, well, it's, you think of it as a, a, a chair. You think of him or her as a piece of furniture. It's a bother, we don't want it. Sheds too much, barks too much, scratches the furniture. Let's get rid of it. Uh, <coughs> there's that's that's why we created this. They're not our property. <coughs> We're not their owners. Uh, it's time we really looked at at other species as individuals with their own needs, their own interests, and 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 <coughs> acted more responsibly to them. And and uh, <coughs> there there needs to be a tremendous shift in the way we we relate and treat animals. I, I do want to come back in much greater detail and talk about your campaign. But I often wonder when I drive by and see some poor dog chained to a tree, and this is how he spends his life. Uh, is his own ignorant? That you, you, when you say owner, try to go, is his owner? <laughs> because, yeah, <laughs> the word owner really fits in that case, doesn't it, though? Yep. You wonder, do they, do they not appreciate that an animal can feel, or do they just don't care? They don't. 
<coughs> again, it varies depending on the person, but someone who does that, they don't think twice about it. They're only thinking of their own needs and not thinking of the needs and interests of that animal. And that's come down because of the way society views animals. And that's what we're trying to change. We're trying to change the paradigm. That's what Jane Goodall has spent her lifetime trying to change the way we perceive other species, other living beings. And that's what I, as a veterinarian, as an animal advocate, are trying to do also. Very good comment, and I applaud your work. It's also, Diane, I, I, I want to add that as a practicing psychologist for 30 years, many, many times I was working with individuals who had that same empathic failure when observing their children or an elderly parent that lived in the home. And that that lack of empathy is sometimes a true lack of empathy, and sometimes, as Elliot's pointing out, a convenience. If I don't have to think about how you feel, it, doesn't, it, it allows me to justify my domination and my, my, uh, my self-interest in, in how I use and relate to you. So I, I think it's not only in the animal kingdom, but that's a place where the other animal kingdom besides human, that's a place where society allows it. But empathic failure is something that is, it's, it's a definite problem. That's, that's how we, that's years ago, that's mm -hmm. how people related to uh, minorities or yes. to uh, women. Uh, children. Children. Uh, in some countries, children are bought and sold uh, at thought of as property. And our, in the United States, we've moved away from that kind of thing. Well, certainly if we label something, quote, property, <coughs> it's easy to keep them in subordination. I mean, makes perfect sense, right? Hasn't science proven also, my, and my last question in, uh, on this particular topic, hasn't science proven that human beings do not have any characteristic that is not shared by at least one other species? Yes, and who cares? I don't care. Uh, I think uh, uh, Dr. Capaldo mentioned it earlier. Common sense shows anyone who's ever lived with a dog or cat or horse or bird or had any contact with uh, another species uh, realizes their this their sensitivity, their intelligence, their creativity, and, and, they and I don't and their feelings. And you don't need science to tell us that they do these things. But but so sci the scientific scientific profession has put themselves and the medical profession have have, have put themselves on a, a pedestal, and we look up to them, and we and and sort of like we, the average person kind of acts like a, a sheep. We can't think for ourselves, what does the scientist tell us is right or wrong, as opposed to what does common sense say to us? Okay, so that begs the next question. Should animals then have the same rights as human beings? If they can feel, they're capable of feeling, they have emotion, they have intelligence, do they get human-like rights? See, the word that we're getting a little clogged up on is same, different same. Uh, there are people who are different than me who deserve rights, and maybe they deserve different rights than I deserve. And I think the same thing holds true with animals, that animals deserve rights, and they deserve uh, essentially the right to be who they are. So, for example, a, a very common occurrence in uh, the factory farming system is that chickens can't even spread their wings. They don't want to vote. We're not here to try to help chickens get a vote. You know, people try to ridicule the agenda of the animal rights movement by turning it into an absurd, uh, an absurd, con absurd conclusion. But if a, if, a, if a chicken has wings, then it has the right to spread those wings, and we deny them rights inherent in the nature of their being. They also have the right to not have to suffer, especially at our hands, uh, if it's not necessary. And, you know, it's not necessary in 99% of the situations where, you know, we are addressing our, our concerns. <coughs> so sameness is is not always the best criteria. It's, as Jerry Betham said, it's not can they reason or can they think, or we could add, are they the same as us, but rather can they suffer? And a compassionate person is called to action from that criteria alone, regardless of inte intellectual levels, regardless of whether they're a social animal, living families, or they're solitary and don't. It's not how much somebody is like me. That's a very narcissistic perspective. How much is it, he, she, it, like me, and therefore I will be compassionate and extend rights? It's not a good, it's not a good place to start our arguments. I, I tend to, when you ask the question about should they have rights, <coughs> and a lot of times uh, uh, legal scholars will say, well, you should only give rights to individuals who can recognize the rights of others. That's a common way to dismiss it. <coughs> and I identify, I think of uh, domesticated animals that we've taken them out of their natural environment, we've made them dependent on us. I think of them that we should treat them as we treat children. Uh, so that you, you, you give a child certain rights 
so that it, uh, that, that child can't be abused, can't be exploited. <coughs> you don't say this child has a right to vote. I mean, infants don't say uh, we're giving the, we're protecting this child, giving them certain rights so they can go out and vote. No, there's no. You don't think of it being frivolous to say infants and children ought to have rights to protect them. And I don't think it's uh, ridiculous and frivolous to say that other species should have rights to protect them uh, and, uh, uh, and pr from abuse, from exploitation. Well, and clearly, that's, and like that's children, what we're striving for. they're very vulnerable. And, and they're vulnerable because we've made them, we've, ta we've taken them out of their, t say with dogs and cats, we've taken them out of their natural environment, domesticated, made them dependent on us, and, and we obviously, we treat them for the most part as children. We take them away from their, their parents at, uh, at a very early age, six weeks, and then make them dependent on us. Therefore, we have an obligation to be their guardians, to, to, to treat them and, and be responsible as we would be responsible to our children as a parent to a child because we've made them dependent on us. They, they, they can't survive in the environment that we bring them into uh, on their own. Let me ask you both a question. Do you believe that most Americans favor animal rights? Is this an issue that people generally care about? Um, I personally believe that. I believe that most people are compassionate and I believe that when most people see the actual issues and realities, uh, as I say, they're called to action. It's very few people who could look at, for example, uh, a research protocol that involved cutting cats' ears off and restraining them in a stereotaxic device. There are very few people who would not say, why, do you, why are you doing that? There are very few people who aren't going to try to do something or at least care about it. They may be afraid to take action, but care about the dog who's chained in the backyard. Uh, and also studies tell us that uh, people by and large want to buy uh, cruelty-free products. They want to not use animals in a detrimental way. So the, the public is very compassionate and you can see by the membership of many of the national organizations, there are a lot of people out there who agree. <coughs> and. Uh, I, I think for the most part there still is um, probably still on some levels uh, not enough, a large enough percentage because of the fact that the industries that exploit and abuse animals, the fur industry, the uh, animal experimentation industry, pharmaceutical they have industry, pharmaceutical, they have public relations firms, rhetoric is continually coming out and that through their advertising dollar they influence our legislators, they, uh, they influence the media, and through lobbying and so forth, they influence our legislators. And, and so the, the public is, for the most part, is hearing a distorted story. And that's why I was pleased to come onto your show today, say, because there usually is not enough opportunity for the public to hear what the advocates of, of other species of animals have to say. Usually they hear it from the, the industries that are exploitative. And, uh, and so the average person doesn't know who to believe. And since they hear most, get most of their information from, from the ex industries that exploit and harm animals, uh, that, that kind of placates them and gives a feeling that everything's okay, it's not as bad, these other people are, are strange, they're terrorists, they're crazy, where are they coming Can't from? Can't deal with people. Can't <laughs> deal with people. Uh, uh, then, then the average person says, yeah, I, I can't make up my mind, but that sounds reasonable, so I, I'll, I'll, tr I'll try to be reasonable and try to and accept what I'm being told by the experts, by the specialists, and so forth. And, and, and as a result, the, those of us who advocate for change, uh, it's, a, it's a real strong uphill battle because we are fighting such multi-billion dollar industries. In I want to talk with you about your campaign um, that, that you developed and is very successful. But before we do, let's leave the studio for a minute and let's go visit you in Boulder, Colorado. There is a war of words in Boulder, Colorado, between pet owners and pet guardians. And at least according to the Humane Society, there is a difference. Being somebody's guardian denotes a much higher level of responsibility than being the owner of, of a thing. Ordinance 7062 concerning licensing and regulation of animals. The Boulder City Council 
guardian of the public interest, agreed and recently became the first in the nation to change all references to pet owners in the city law books to pet guardians. The new law doesn't change the penalty for mistreating animals, but its backers say the measure is not about punishment. It's about perception. Hey, Bosco. What happened in Boulder began here in San Francisco, where a group of animal activists decided the word owner was, in a word, offensive. And that changing it was not silly or meaningless, but one part of an important statement. An underlying cause of so much of the mistreatment and abuse and exploitation of animals in society comes about because animals are just seen and perceived as property. Elliot Katz is a veterinarian and an animal rights activist who pushed for the change in Boulder. For Dr. Katz, this is more than a word game and anything but a joke. As a veterinarian, I have had people come into my office and say, this dog is shedding too much, please kill it. They only saw that animal as their property, disposable objects. Dr. Katz, tell us about this campaign to have animals no longer treated as things, as commodities. <clears throat> Where to begin? Um, mm. uh, basically, and I certainly don't want to make light of this, I, as a veteran, for decades now as a veterinarian, I've, I've cared deeply and, and ministered to the needs of animals as a veterinarian when animals were brought in with all sorts of viral diseases, being hit by cars and so forth. And <clears throat> for the past 20 years, I've been an advocate for the animals uh, through uh, the organization in defense of animals. <clears throat> And, and we have, uh, it's been brought to our attention and we have uh, corrected in many instances, many cases of animal exploitation, cruelty and abuse. And over the years I started realizing that what we were doing was put, doing Band-Aid cures. And so I realized that if we really want to make changes and improve the, 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 the welfare uh, of animals, we had to change the paradigm, the overall thinking about animals, instead of just saying, well, we're going to stop this thing from happening, this thing. We needed to raise the status of animals in society. We needed to raise a level of respect uh, that we give to other species. Otherwise, if we don't have that, I, I felt I was spinning my wheels. It would go on forever and ever that I would be doing these, trying to stop these individual kinds of abuses and exploitation and cruelty. And that's why we came up with this campaign. A, a, a glaring, uh, there's many glaring examples. Uh, what I talked about is people bringing their animals into me when I was practicing as a veterinarian. A cat might scratch the furniture. They want the cat put down, or a dog might bark or shed. Uh, we had a, if I'm going on too long, let me know. <laughs> we had a case, I was contacted, this is Vermont, about two years ago. <clears throat> a man put in his will that when he died, his two horses should be killed, should be put down. He was afraid that when he died, no one would take care of the horses the way he did. <clears throat> he eventually died, and uh, a neighbor, a young girl, uh, and some of her friends knew the horses, loved those horses, and wanted to give them a home. They went to court and said, don't kill the, uh, the, the horses to the judge. His attorney got up in court and said, those animals were his property. He had a right to do with them what he wanted. The court should allow those animals to be killed. And when, when some of our members heard the word that his property, they contacted us. We filed an amicus brief with the judge explaining how society's views of animals are changing. They shouldn't just be viewed as property. And the judge ruled in our favor. Hallelujah. Would not, would not allow the horses to be killed. And, and in her findings, she included literally half of our amicus brief about how society's views of changes and animals should not, are just not things and tables and so forth. <coughs> this is the paradigm we're trying to change, that somebody's, that individuals have, at this point, have the right to just kill or abuse an animal because it's their property. Uh, we, we have s uh, staff in, in many s uh, states around the country. We have a, a chimpanzee sanctuary in Cameroon, Africa. Uh, at a sanctuary for abused animals in Mississippi. We raid puppy mills, we raid dog fighting rings. And what happens is we raid farmers who, uh, because either through ignorance or callousness or cr outright cruelty, 
allow half their animals to starve, or in puppy mills where, where dogs are going blind from ulcerations and all, all sorts of neglect. We, we, we raid them with the local authorities, with the police. The animals are taken away. We spend hundreds of dollars on veterinary bills fixing up these animals, getting them back to health. And then the, quotes owner goes back to court and said, those animals are my property. These are the remaining ones that didn't die. And the courts, because of the strength of property rights in our country, gives back the remaining animals for them to further abuse and starve and, and neglect. And so this is why it's so important to, to change that balance and not have animals just seen as property. Because we respect property rights so strongly in our society that any being that's considered property is is, is literally nothing. I'm going to come back to you in just a moment and ask you about some of your more significant accomplishments. <laughs> what are some of the things you're most proud of? Before I do, Theo, tell us about your organization and your work. Uh, Neves is a Boston-based organization that's about 106 years old, and our single focus has always been on the use of animals in research. Uh, I think it's a very hard area to work in because the medical lobbyists have been very successful in framing the argument as it's your child or this rat, it's your child or this dog. And uh, having a board and advisory board that's made up of uh, surgeons and physicians and PhD researchers, uh, we're here to try to bring forth the reality, which is that not only is it unethical and inhumane, but it's not good science and uh, that the American public is really being uh, duped, we believe, um, by this strong lobbying arm whose sole purpose is to keep this big business of animal research going. And in fact, as Dr. Ray Greek said, it's really not a question of your child or this rat or dog. It's a question of your child or big business. And he actually wrote a book exposing, and one of many that have come out, but his is particularly easy to read for the lay audience, exposing the harm to humans as the result of animal research. I, mean, I, I just have one quote here that <coughs> tells you a little bit what we're up against. According to the American Medical Association's Research Ac Action Plan, they said, the animal activist movement must be shown to be not only anti-science, but also against medical progress. So when I introduce Neves, I think one of the things I want to make very clear is that there are scientists that are involved with Neves, and that we are not anti-science, and that we are not anti-medical progress. We just firmly believe ethically, scientifically, morally, uh, that animal research is not the way to accomplish good science or obviously good ethics. So we focus predominantly on that. We have an educational arm. Uh, and again, to give your, your listeners a sense of how difficult this work is, we've been trying uh, to pass dissection choice legislation, which is the simple right, here we go with that word again, for a student to not have to dissect animals. And we are, uh, we might as well be trying to ban all animal research, and that's the kind of opposition we get. Because I think what they recognize, those, those strong lobbying arms, is that if we get students of conscience to stay in science, that the face of science will change. So mm -hmm. it's a direct threat to the economic basis of, of biomedical research. And, and we're fighting very hard to give students this right. We have many, many students who said, if this is what science means, then I, get, I really don't want to be a scientist. Sure. So we're losing com people of compassion. And that's, um, uh, that's not our only campaign, but I think it's one of our most important ones right oh, now. Oh, I applaud your efforts yeah. there. Dr. Katz, in the minute or so remo remaining before we need to take a break, tell us about your most significant accomplishment. What are you most proud of? <coughs> um, besides getting on this show? <laughs> um, I don't know, it goes on and on. Um, as mentioned earlier, we have a chimpanzee sanctuary in Cameroon, Africa. We have uh, an abused, uh, abused animal sanctuary in uh, Mississippi. We've saved thousands of animals from abusive uh, farmers. Uh, uh, we've uh, closed down uh, uh, vomiting experiments at Rockefeller University. We've closed down cocaine experiments on monkeys uh, in, at uh, NYU. We stopped the army from breaking the legs, uh, bone breaking experiments on uh, retired greyhounds at the, uh, at the Presidio in San Francisco. Uh, we saved 180 be beagles at UC Davis. The veterinary school was ready to kill for dissection purposes uh, uh, because they didn't want them for one uh, particular uh, research. They felt, well, we might as well just kill them and, and uh, practice on them. This is the mentality of the, of the veterinary school. Uh, 
<coughs> the list goes on and on in terms of, uh, of animal experiment. We just recently stopped some brain experiments on, uh, uh, on beagles uh, at the Barrows Institute in, uh, in Arizona. Uh, we just put pressure on the Oregon Regional Primate Center. They released 22 uh, monkeys that were so severely psychotic from, from years of uh, using psychotropic dr uh, drugs on them that they released them uh, because of the pressure of, of, of uh, our exposing their cruelty. Uh, we've uh, stopped the, the, the killing of goats at Catalina Island. We've st uh, stopped the shooting and killing of uh, Thule elk at the, at the uh, Point Reyes National Seashore. Our range of, of, uh, of activities is all over the it's place. It's broad. Very broad. Uh, initially, I got involved because of what was taking place at, in the laboratories of UC Berkeley. A veterinarian there called me, and, uh, and well, actually, I, I called the veterinarian. He told me what he was under fire for refusing to sign USDA documents. And so I formed In Defense of Animals to help a colleague who was under attack for trying to be a responsible veterinarian. <coughs> and uh, we eventually uh, filed a lawsuit uh, against the USDA, and they because of that, they eventually sued the university, fined them twelve thousand dollars, issued a cease and desist order. Uh, I, you know, we've had successful lawsuits against uh, vivisectors who call us uh, terrorists. Um, I'm, we're all over the place in terms of uh, as a veterinarian, my, I, I, I've experienced and seen the horrors that go on in laboratories, um, and I still try to maintain that is as an important facet of what we do. And when we come back from the following announcements, I'd like to talk about animal research specifically. So to our viewers, please stay tuned. Yeah, Morgan here. Go. Oh, hi. Right now? Uh, okay. The eensy weensy spider climbed up the hey. water spout. Down came the rain and washed the spider out. Out came the sun and dried up all the rain. And the eensy weensy spider climbed up the spout again. I love you, Daddy. I love you, sweetheart. <laughs> Family. Isn't it about time? What can I say? It's my girl. From the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. You know how inquisitive kids are. That's why you store sharp objects in a safe place, keep medicines out of reach, and if you have a gun, you keep it unloaded and locked away. As concerned members of the television community, we urge you to be just as careful with television. Kids don't always know what they're watching. That's why you should. Kids aren't afraid of other kids. Or people with different color skin. That's because kids know there are other things. Worse things. Bigger things to be afraid of. Like monsters from outer space! Remember, friends come in all colors. Massachusetts School of Law Educational Forum, where we're discussing animal rights. Let's turn the discussion now specifically to animal research, whether it's ethical, whether it's immoral, and, and the like. Science presumes that certain animals are genetically similar enough to human beings that experiments on them are going to produce a human reaction that they can find as useful. Yet to me, that's problematic, because if we're saying animals are, quote, like human beings, then how can we justify morally, ethically, and legally doing research on them? 
So, Theo, your comments on that. Well, I, I'm going to take your, your statement, which is an important one, and put a little twist on it in that uh, researchers, vivisectors, vivisection is the cutting up of a live animal for scientific or educational purposes, they use that to their advantage in both situations. And let me give you a concrete example. Uh, Pfizer had, uh, uh, had a uh, pain, pain, um, pain medication in clinical trials. And the USDA stopped the trials because they realized it had caused cancer in laboratory, I think it was mice, but it might have been rats. And Pfizer responded with, well, but there's no evidence of it, provide, of it causing cancer in humans. So researchers will use the argument of animals are like us to justify what they're doing, and then they'll use the argument, well, they're not really like us, so it couldn't even predict it. I have volumes of quotes from researchers themselves talking about uh, what a failure basically mice and rat cancer research has been, and one quote from a former um, head of the National Cancer Institute actually says, you know, we've been curing cancer in mice for decades, it simply doesn't work in humans. So on a scientific level, there are so many differences that science themselves are now taking to heart the, the scientific imperative to find better models because animal models are poor, if not dangerous, models. So on that physiological difference, uh, there, there's, a, there's a real need for change. On a moral and philosophical difference, uh, are we the same or are we different? Are they like us or not like us? Again, uh, sameness should not be the criteria for compassion. The ability to suffer should be. So whether they're like us or unlike us, should we be doing this? No. Ethically and now scientifically, no. So, <coughs> Dr. Katz. Yes. Is animal research necessary to the improvement of human health? <coughs> well, uh, let, let me first, uh, I, as to listening to uh, uh, Theo, <coughs> I just wanted to go, and, and in the answer to your question, I wanted to perhaps go into a little bit of the specifics of what kind of research takes place. <coughs> uh, right now, there are mother deprivation studies where they take baby monkeys away from their mothers and watch them literally go crazy. Uh, they'll give psychotropic drugs, they'll give speed, and they'll give uh, cocaine to monkeys and other animals. With all the knowledge that we have, with, with God knows hundreds of thousands and millions of people that have the trouble with these drugs, and, you, and we know as much as we need to in terms of how one reacts to drugs and how what go, one goes through with withdrawal. Uh, with all the information we have about that infants need love uh, to be doing experiments that are still psychological experiments on other species to determine what's involved with, with loss of attachment is absolutely ridiculous. It's common sense. It's common sense. We already know these answers and uh, uh, Theo can probably respond to that. And it causes the, the ex extremest amounts of pain uh, to, 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 to put, to have baby monkeys terrified, uh, clinging to, to, uh, to whatever they can because uh, they've been taken away from their mothers, to have uh, uh, dogs, monkeys go through withdrawal symptoms from, from cocaine and other addictive drugs, to go through convulsions, uh, uh, vomiting and diarrhea as the withdrawal symptoms is for me as a veterinarian, for me as a human being, it's so ludicrous, so cruel, and yet this, this kind of information doesn't come out to the public. The public doesn't really know the degree of the suffering, the degree of the horrors, and so it's packaged as, well, is this really necessary? Here's what's going on, but you don't really get to see the guts of how much pain, how much suffering is going on, and that's why, and the only time you get to see it is when someone maybe breaks into a laboratory or you get some sort of undercover footage and then you get to see just how horrible things are. And then, and, and then you have that imagery and then I'm on a program like this and we still don't want to show the imagery because it might turn people off. But that's what motivates me because I forced myself to see it. I remember the images in veterinary school. I was forced to conduct these kinds of things because years ago there was no animal rights movement and if I and I, when I said I didn't want to do it they said I'm sorry you do it you're out and that I, I wanted to be a veterinarian people don't don't know the the depth of the of the torture the pain and the suffering that goes on it's whitewashed by the biomedical community and by by many other industries whether it's the fur industry or the 
some of the uh, what goes on in, in other industries. Uh, and, and, and therefore, we have these intellectual arguments rather than coming from the heart and, and, and as Theo said, from compassion, saying we, we, we as a society cannot allow this egregious torture and brutalization. I mean, drilling holes into the brains of, of monkeys, keep putting them in stereotactic devices uh, so they can't move, depriving them of water to force them to, 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 to learn or, in quotes, train them to do certain things. Uh, it's just horrible, horrible to see the images of, of, of baby monkeys huddled and in, 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 in frightened, terrorized. In, in, in You've it's brought with you, haven't you, some of that investigative work and those horrible in images? Yes, and, and, I, and I'm sure the most horrible of them won't be shown because you don't want to turn people off, but it is horrible. Uh, uh, the break, taking perfectly healthy animals breaking their legs, breaking their backs, uh, putting chemicals in their eyes, blinding them, doing everything imaginable that one can think of is just, it's just horrific and the public is not aware of it and, and what the public sees is guided tours guided tours, so the, 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 the business section laboratory will let a, a media come in on a guided tour. So everything is cleaned up, you don't see the reality, you don't see of the pain and on. suffering, you don't see it. So all you see is what they want you to see, which looks nice and clean and sterile, and the public buys it because there's so many, so many injustices and so many starving children in, in all parts of place of Africa, and now we have the, the terrorists with, with the, uh, the, the the September 11th terror. There's so many things that, that the average person is thrown at that to have one more thing thrown at them is just too much. So they, they you so. Know, you know, Diane, just to interrupt for a minute, Elliot, I, I think he makes an excellent point in yeah. that uh, what I've always said is if slaughterhouses were made with glass walls and research laboratories were made with glass walls, I would get to work in my yard weekends instead of working on this issue. If people were able to see the truth behind for example, biomedical research, uh, there, there would be uh, outrageous outcry against it. And that's what the animal movement is carrying. It's carrying that awareness and that outrage. Just to go back to Elliot's and, and example. And just to interrupt you for a minute. See, now uh, we're really getting into it. Right? Is, is that we, we become the, the, the messengers of, and, and the messenger gets, the, gets their heads cut off or gets, you know, no one wants to be the, you know, the messenger of bad news of horrible things usually gets it, but anyway. Let me, let me, let me go back to the maternal deprivation research that Elliot was uh, mentioning. Because Dr. Katz. At, at, at Dr. Katz, sorry. I uh, was mentioning uh, the psychology major. I was very aware of the work of Harry Harlow and very disgusted even back in 1960. Uh, he used terms like um, rape racks, wells of despair, pits of loneliness. He said the most outrageous things, like it takes no brains to create depression in a monkey. And his research is to this day some of the most horrific research, which is still being carried on by generations of Harry Harlow researchers. Now, people would say, well, don't we need to learn about what happens if a child is taken from his or her mother? Well, we know what happens. And in fact, even before Harlow began his research, there was a man named John Bowlby, who in the 1950s published a great deal of research from his investigation of war orphans. What happened to children after World War II, children who were deprived of their parents? Mm -hmm. There was nothing new that Harlow told us, could tell us, that needed to be learned by torturing generations of primates who, like us, have great social needs and needs for companionship. And we've seen video footage of infant monkeys huddled together in absolute terror. So why was it done and why is it allowed? Because there's a huge economic advantage for the biomedical industry to maintain the myth that animal research is humane, regulated, and necessary if you care about human health. It's my, my dad died last year from heart disease. I had a cousin who grew up with cerebral palsy. People don't have to tell me about suffering and human disease. I know about that. I've had to sit with women as a therapist who were losing their children to leukemia. Uh, it was the hardest part of my work. I remember one woman whose little seven-year-old daughter took 
you know, two and a half years to die a horrible death from leukemia. I am not not concerned about human health, and what I try to help people see is, if you are too, then you need to help us end animal research. It's not good for them, and it's not good for us. It's a money-driven, it's an economic-driven uh, industry. I actually have statistics here, and I won't bore your, reader, your, your listeners, but um, it's a multi-billion dollar industry. Uh, Massachusetts alone, I believe in, 19, in 2000, got close to a billion dollars in research money. Close to a billion dollars. Now, what's interesting about that is Massachusetts is home to more biotechnology companies than all 48 other states and all of Western Europe. So we ought to be really healthy. But if we look at the World Health Organization statistics on healthy life, America is down at around 25 or 26 with all of the European countries doing much better than us. France, they even live longer than us in France, even with all that rich food and cigarette smoking. And the wine. And the wine. <laughs> there may be the wine, actually. That may be the secret. Um, Spain, Italy, the United Kingdom, though we are the greatest consumer of animals in research and the greatest spender for animal research, we don't have the health statistics that show that it is benefiting anyone. Now, we but, don't stop uh, and think about that. I'm going to jump in a minute. Yeah. You asked about why does it continue. It continues because it's, it's similar to in the, with the Environmental Protection Agency, the corporations put their people in there so that there's not going to be too much pressure on corporations and businesses that pollute the environment. <coughs> the people who control, who are in the, the top agencies of the National Institutes of Health and, and many of these charities and so forth, they come from the ranks of animal experimentation. That's what they believe in. That's what they want to see continue. That's what their friends are being funded to do. And so this gravy train continues mm -hmm. uh, because they put in people of like-minded. I've met and talked with people who do non-animal based technologies and they're frustrated because there are inadequate funds going to fund the non-animal technologies. So when, when youngsters graduate after being desensitized through dissection uh, and thinking that animals are a means to our end, that's what a little bit of what this section is about, they are going to go into where, if they're going to go into research, they're going to go looking where is the most money available to me so that I can get grants so I can put my kids through college and pay the mortgage. And that goes into animal experimentation. So we're, we've recently started a campaign and we're calling it at this point the 5% solution a reallocation plan. We know we can't stop vivisection because of the way the gravy train works and because of the conflicts of interest. People don't want to be put out of work and out of their livelihood. So we're looking to start getting the government, charities, universities to reduce the amount of research on animals by 5% and reallocate the funds to non-animal technologies, mm -hmm. the changing the funding base. When, when a researcher retires at a university, we want to see that university hire uh, or bring on a researcher who uses non-animal technologies. We want to see a movement from animal-based technologies to non-animal-based technologies. The non-animal-based technologies are out there. They're not alternatives. They're, they're simply a, a more humane, a more compassionate, and a less expensive and a more effective way of doing research. And this includes clinical research and epidemiological, epidemiological research, but all sorts of tissue culture, cell culture, working with genes. All of these things do not involve animal experimentation. And there has to be a push by the American public to support this reallocation of resources so that our, the next generation of, of researchers can go into fields and know that there's funding there for non-animal based technologies. We're about out of time, Theo. So I want to give you the final opportunity to tell us about your most significant accomplishment. What are you most proud of? Well, I, I think to go back uh, about 20 years, I'm going to just hand pick a few. Uh, Neves was instrumental in being the first state to repeal the pound seizure law, which meant that in the old days, uh, when homeless animals were not claimed, or if the, uh, the guardian at the time, owner, did not have an opportunity to find their animal, they very well ended up in research laboratories. So that was a victory in setting a tone for the whole movement, which is to bring the public in and say, you know, if this were your dog, if this were your companion animal, would you want this happening to them? And from that, I think a, a great deal of consciousness started. Um, I think of late, 
the most important, one of the most important things to speak of alternatives. We're not going to have time to talk about that then. We're not. So let me get a quick one in. Not, we not, have, not alternatives, not animal uh, technologies. Uh, we have uh, funded uh, a researcher from Sweden who's a PhD toxicologist and an MD. And for years, the way the biomedical community tested for toxicity was to take animals and give the animals the toxic poisonous substance to see uh, when 50% of them died. It's called the LD50. It's cruel. It only predicted human toxicity at, uh, at an accuracy rate of about 60 or 65%. It, in it involved millions of animals every year. And Dr. Beyond Ekfall, through laboratories in 15 countries, 29 laboratories in 15 countries, developed a very simple cell line to test for toxicity, which can predict human toxicity at a 72% accuracy rate. So it's better than the animal test, and nobody suffers. Finally, in terms of the alternatives, because I've got to get a couple in, even though I'd love to be able to talk about all the good things Neves did, epidemiological research. During the Olympics in Atlanta, Georgia, they did an epidemiological study on asthma. And what they found was, because of having uh, decreased traffic congestion in the city, that there was a 44% decrease in asthma admissions to the hospital for children. If people want to change uh, childhood illnesses, they have to start paying attention to research like that, rather than research which is going to, for 10, 15 years, at the tune of anywhere from a quarter of a million to a million dollars, trying to induce artificial asthmas in dogs, cats, what and other What you're saying is, uh, we should look for ways to prevent by cleaning up the environment and the air we breathe uh, 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 asthma as opposed to looking for band-aid cures and how to treat it, which is which the pharmaceutical companies make billions right. of dollars from rather in, than in cleaning up the faulty, air we breathe. Right. I would also ask your viewers, anyone watching, to think of themselves as guardians of their animals, no longer use the word owner. I would ask any law professor, any individual, anyone who comes in contact with an animal to be proud as, as, the, as the people in the cities of, of uh, uh, Berkeley, uh, Berkeley uh, West Hollywood, Boulder, and state of Rhode Island, and, and say, I am the guardian of my animal. I know my responsibilities to that animal, and I'm going to live up to them. And move away from this outdated and cruel concept that animals are our property to be exploited, to be discarded, to be abused at an owner's whim. We are out of time, so I want to thank you both very much for joining us, and I want to thank our viewing audience. I ask you to now turn your attention to the screen if you can. You will see some video that Dr. Katz brought us from an in undercover investigation, as well as some other scenes that are very hard, but are very realistic of what is going on in the world of animal research and has gone on. So if you can, please stay tuned. Otherwise, we'll see you next time. Thank you for joining us.
Before you know it, she talks. Before you know it, she walks. Before you know it, she knows you. Before you know it, she has a heart. Before you know you're pregnant, when your baby's no bigger than a grain of rice. Before she's a twinkle in your eye, that's when you need to take folic acid every day. After that, it's too late to prevent some serious birth defects. Folic acid now, before you know it. What inspired David to spend a lifetime exploring distant planets? Star Trek. What inspired Nicole to bring new life into the world? The first time I saw St. Elsewhere. And what inspired Stephen to risk his life for others? Go Street Blues. Television. Who will it inspire next? Hello? Hi, honey. What are you doing? <sighs> doing homework with my friends. Aren't I supposed to? Just call to say hi, that's all. Hi? That's all? Yep. Dad, that's so cool. But hey, coolness runs in our family. Well, I was thinking that I need my allowance a little early. What a coincidence. I need someone to clean the garage for me. Really? <laughs> Family. I'll, I'll see you tonight, Dad. Isn't it about All right. time? I love you. I love you too, Dad. From the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. there when Dr. King shared his dream with the world. I have a dream today. And I was there when we launched Men to the Moon. I was even there when Mark McGuire broke the home run record. Yep, I've seen a lot in my day. Thanks to television, of course. play a little golf. Why? Because it's Saturday and that's the day that Dad plays golf. Why? Because I really like golf. But why? <laughs> well, good question. Because most of the time I just spend the day chasing a little white ball around the course. Why? Well, usually it's because I hit the ball into the rough or out of bounds. Why? I don't know. Sometimes I wonder why I even took up this game. Maybe I'll come back a little. Why? Well, for starters, maybe I could spend a few more Saturdays doing something with you. Hey, Dad? Huh? When? Family. Isn't it about time? <laughs> From the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints.